Okay, let's return to the collapse of the ceasefire in eastern Ukraine and John Herbst of the Atlantic Council think tank, who's also a former U.S. ambassador to Ukraine, joins me now from Washington. Thank you for joining us. So Debaltseva seems to be um, a bit of a, a problem for both uh, the Ukrainian soldiers and the uh, Russian-supported um, rebels. This is going to be a problem, isn't it, for the, the ceasefire? Well, I think you can lay the blame squarely at the foot of the Kremlin. Um, let's remember that the ceasefire that was agreed on Thursday was supposed to go into effect immediately. But the separatists in the Kremlin said no, and they agreed to have a two-and-a-half-day delay before the ceasefire went into effect. And then the rebels, with Kremlin support, tried to take the town in heavy, very heavy fighting before the ceasefire went into effect. When they failed, the separatists announced that the ceasefire did not really apply to Debaltseva, which is a very strange definition of a ceasefire that apply everywhere except for the place where most of the fighting is going on. Well, so it's very clearly a violation by the Russians and their, their puppets in Ukraine. So what can be done? Because Mr. Putin, where is he? He's in Hungary at the moment and he's commenting on all of this, very much leading from the front. What about Angela Merkel and Mr. Hollande? Is there anything they can say that will be, will be heard by Mr. Putin? Yes. They should claim that he is violating the ceasefire and there could be no sanctions relief because they, he is violating the ceasefire. That would be heard very loud and clear but in the Kremlin. But Mr. Putin does not seem to take any notice to anybody. What can the U.S. Well, do? I mean, they did say that they were thinking about uh, delivering arms to the Ukrainian soldiers to offer them support. Well, I think that would be a very good thing. I believe the United States should have long ago supplied weapons, defensive lethal weapons to the Ukrainians to make it harder for the Russians to commit more aggression in Ukraine, to take more territory in Ukraine. And if Europe were to join, that would make the message even stronger. So has this just been a diplomatic waste of time then? Well, um, I think it demonstrates that uh, one side is interested in having a peace and the other side is not. In that sense, there's some value in it. But I, I don't think Mr. Putin will be dissuaded by diplomacy. He will only be dissuaded by strong action, United States and Europe, in, in harmony against his aggression in Ukraine. Just remind us, um, Ambassador Herbst, what is Mr. Putin gaining from eastern Ukraine? Why is this such a prize for him? Well, he, here, for, I, I should start by saying he has nowhere said to anyone in the West what he would do, uh, excuse me, what conditions he needs for peace. His, his motivation, he kept, he's kept deliberately dark. My belief is this. He would like to have a compliant government in Kiev. If he cannot have a compliant government in Kiev, he wants to destabilize Ukraine so that the government in Kiev cannot successfully establish a democracy, a market economy, and align its natural, national security policies with Europe. To do that, he needs to go further and further into Ukraine so that there is never any stability in the country. That, I believe, is his objective. So this is Mr. Putin's war on European values, then? Absolutely. This is what he does not want. Let, let's keep in mind, this has little to do or nothing to do with NATO. This all began because Europe and, excuse me, the European Union and Ukraine were talking about signing a trade agreement. This is how this began. Do you think people outside, and I'm talking about the West here and the EU, are they being too hesitant with Mr. Putin? Absolutely. Um, they are treating him like one of them. Um, countries that are interested or leaders that are interested in, in stability and in peace. Instead, Mr. Putin is a revisionist. He has stated that he has the right and the duty to protect ethnic Russians and Russian speakers wherever they may live. And many live in Ukraine, many live in the Baltic countries, many live in Kazakhstan, many live in Poland. He has also said that the rules created in the post-Cold War order have to change or there will be no rules. So he has very clear objectives to change the rules, which means change the borders established at, at the end of the Cold War. He did it in Georgia. He's trying to do it now in Ukraine. And he will go beyond Ukraine if he is successful in Ukraine. Okay, Ambassador Herbst, thank you very much for your insight there. Thank you.